All right, welcome everyone to uh, the session today. Your session chaired by McBeb Gemida and with a number of illustrious panelists is named Coastal Virginia and African-American Sociocultural Ecologies, Past and Present. And just to introduce myself, my name is Patty Sunderland. I'm sitting here in my office in New York and I am the moderator for this session, which just means I'm responsible for hosting this session. The session chair, as I said, is Macbeth Gamida, and he will lead today's session. And before we get started, please note that in this webinar format, all participant audio and video are disabled. We ask that if you have questions or comments, you just use the chat option that's located at the bottom of your screen. And, and we're gonna take all the questions for the speakers at the end. So after all the speakers have had a chance to talk, then we will take questions. And the session will run for approximately one hour and 45 minutes. And you can uh, find and turn on captions also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And after the meeting, participants will be able to engage with the session chair and all of these speakers on the Whova Meetup channel which you will get to by going through Whova. And thank you again for attending today's session, Coastal Virginia and African-American Sociocultural Ecologies, past and present. And uh, I will now, uh, and I'm gonna turn this over to McBev Gemida and he will introduce the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, I hope you can all hear me. It's, it's a pleasure to, uh, uh, to have you all join us and, uh, and to be joined by, by wonderful colleagues who are draw, doing um, uh, great work in, in all these areas that we're going to discuss today. My name again is Macbeth Gameda. I serve as Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at Eastern Virginia Medical School, which is located in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and this topic is obviously very interesting um, for us because of um, the work we do with engaging our communities um, and, um, and our role and mission and vision to enhance the health and well-being of the communities we serve in this area. And it's also a great pleasure uh, to be hosting this event with um, on um, the Old Dominion U University Institute for the Humanities, with whom we uh, collaborate and work on a, on a number of areas that are related to creating conversations that, that uh, expand and advance inclusion uh, of our communities here. Um, first, I want to um, um, acknowledge uh, the sacred land on which we live and work. Uh, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of indigenous people, such as the Chesapean and the Nansimand and the Nottaway. And today, Hampton Roads is still home to their descendants, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to flourish on this land and recognize the extreme stress that they have endured. Um, our presenters today include um, uh, uh, Dr. John Braxton, uh, who is a uh, uh, professor emerita at the College of William and Mary. Um, I would ask them to introduce themselves briefly, um, but uh, her talk today would, uh, would focus on history, memory, and healing. Um, and also um, uh, she would talk about the intersection of the African-American experience when they, with the indigenous experience in this area. Um, uh, my other colleague, Linda Holmes, um, a writer, independent scholar and curator. Um, she has done a lot of work in public health and um, in, in um, really thinking about particularly um, the, the historical context of, um, of nourishing um, communities. And her talk is remembering black midwives, pillars of community support. Uh, Barbara Hambly is the, um, my uh, third colleague, the third presenter, who is producer and host of Another View radio show here. And uh, she has been um, a, a person who has engaged and, and brought together uh, voices. And uh, her talk would be creating space 
for the American, uh, for the African American voice. Um, my, the, the following speaker will be Avi Santo, Associate Professor and Chair of Department of Communication and Theater Arts at the Old Dominion University. And he will talk about digitizing African American stories of plays in Norfolk, uh, the potentialities and pitfalls of digital story mapping. And last but not least, is my colleague from Eastern Virginia Medical School, um, uh, I'm Dr. Andrew Plunk, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, and he will talk about virtual community engagement and COVID-19, giving marginalized communities a voice during the pandemic. So the session in general, as, it, as, as described, will touch on the experiences of African Americans in this region, past and present, as the point of entry for the, um, for the African American experience. It will explore memory, healing, and resilience, and it will talk about challenges and contemporary retelling of and, and, and engagement of voices. And it will also talk about um, the challenges that are, that are presented in that context of engagement and retelling. To say a little bit about the area, um, it is coastal Virginia, one of the most vi vibrant coastal uh, ways in the area with deep water, you know, uh, estuary of the James River and protected by the peninsula. Uh, and then, you know, uh, connected by the Nansevant and Elizabeth Rivers, connected to the Chesapeake Bay um, and deep water channels linking the, uh, to the South North Carolina and to the North all the way to Richmond. And the port cities, vibrant port cities that include Norfolk, Portsmouth, South, and, um, uh, and Newport News and Hampton in the north. This context shaped the experiences as well, because, you know, as a very vibrant um, coastal portal area, um, it, it, it was very involved in the trade um, and in, in naval, uh, in the naval uh, area here. It has also been a uh, very vibrant gateway for the uh, Underground Railroad um, through the coastal ways, actually, through schooners and um, uh, that have actually uh, navigated the way up and created a pathway um, from North Carolina and other areas to pass through uh, uh, this Hampton Roads and, and um, a vibrant transportation up uh, uh, with uh, uh, through the river with boats. Uh, one um, one story that comes to mind would be uh, the story of uh, uh, George Latimer in 1842, uh, who, um, uh, who's, uh, uh, whose property was uh, James uh, Gray, who actually had um, a, a shop right by the, by the water. Uh, and, um, and, and George uh, left and, and went actually by boat all the way to Boston. And it became a big history because someone visiting Boston saw him there and reported that to, uh, to Gray, who went up and, um, and uh, there was a, a court procedure actually to get him back uh, to, uh, to Norfolk, uh, which was actually uh, uh, stopped by a demonstration of over 300 people. And uh, Gray returned and uh, actually just got a payment of $400 for uh, George Latimer. And George Latimer was the father of the great um, engineer and, um, and inventor, uh, Louis Latimer. So this were, you know, this is one story of uh, numerous tens of thousands who have gone through uh, the Underground Railway here. Uh, and most recently, we have St. Mary's Church, the oldest church, Catholic church in, um, in, in the United States, which is located here in Norfolk, which um, actually excavations showed uh, an area where uh, the Underground Railroad was uh, vibrantly uh, operated through, uh, through the church. So I would leave it there and I would open this to the conversation of my colleagues, uh, starting with, uh, uh, with uh, my colleague, Joan Braxton. Joan, it's yours. Thank you, McBiv. It's so pleasant to be here with you this morning. Um, my talk today is um, Red Black Spirit Medicine in the Chesapeake, Origins of the Wine Oak, 1619 to the Present. 
uh, a version of this paper was given at the American Academy of Religion in 2017, and a different version of this presentation was also given at the Library of Congress in February 2018 to launch 1619 and the Making of America in collaboration with the 2019 comm commemoration and also in collaboration with Norfolk State University. And this was in fact the very first of all of the Virginia 16, uh, 19, 2019 events occurring at the Library of Congress in 2018. And today's uh, presentation will be subtly different. It is a glimpse into the interactions of persons of African descent with native peoples in coastal Virginia. And I ask you to keep in mind, please, that the roads in those days were the waterways. The roads were in the water. So my ancestry, my DNA ancestry shows that I belong to this coastal region in both Virginia and Maryland. And interestingly enough, since we have mentioned the Catholic Church, I have recently discovered a clutch of DNA cousins in Louisiana. And some of you will know where I'm going. They are descendants of the Georgetown 272. I don't know yet whether I have a direct ancestor who was a member of those uh, Africans sold by the Catholic Church to other Catholics in Louisiana but it is a scientific fact that they are members of my family who were taken from the Chesapeake region to um, Louisiana, whose ancestors were, they are descendants of those people. Now, this work is drawn from research into medicinal and ritual practices of uh, the wine oak folk uh, uh, and focuses primarily on historical and anthropological insights into the Wine Oak, the Nottaway, and their neighbors in North Carolina and Virginia. The largest study uh, is a database which um, I uh, have been compiling with Dr. Patrick Johnson since 2017, when I was David Larson Fellow in Spirituality and Health at the Library of Congress. Initially, um, he was just doing research for me for the presentations that I had before me, but now uh, we have turned back to the work to um, expand the database that we began building in 2017. For hundreds of years, the Wine Oak people lived very closely with the Nottaway. Um, they were um, within the Powhatan chiefdom um, and as uh, located on both sides of the James River between the mouths of the Appomattox and Chickahominy. They uh, participated in the 1622 raid that killed uh, 347 people in Jamestown, suffered a retaliatory raid in 1627, a massacre in 1644. And from there, they sought uh, refuge among the Tuscarora down in North Carolina. Um, they had been absorbed largely by other tribes and peoples by 1695, the time William and Mary was established, but they had also um, absorbed a number of um, the original Africans, the original 1619 Africans from uh, Jamestown. Um, the ties include strong cultural ties also to North Carolina with the Tuscarora, the Meharan, and um, 
others. Um, and this is notable uh, in part because uh, many of these folks are um, Iroquoian people, meaning they're speaking Iroquoian language and um, also they have Iroquoian law. Um, so some of these uh, tribes would include, that had close connections would include the Chickahominy, the Mattapanai, the Monacan, the Nansaman, the Pamunkey, uh, the Rappahannock, and, and so forth. And, you know, Langston Hughes comes out of this uh, milieu. One of his um, ancestors was closely uh, related to the Langston family, which is still in the region. Um, with Patrick Johnson, um, uh, now Dr. Patrick Johnson, we have assembled hundreds of historical documents, anthropological descriptions, anthropological materials, and histories of uh, various groups, including descriptions of ritual, agricultural and medicinal practices, and so forth. And we're also aware of the work of anthropologists and historians who have studied these groups before us, including Erica Coleman, Anthony Wallace, Frank Speck, Blair Roods, John Napoleon Bonaparte. Not all of these people are my favorite uh, scholars and it's not my intent to uh, do a complete literature review here, um, but I do want you to know that uh, we have uh, done such a thing and um, that we have um, an incredible uh, database based on um, which is providing um, the grounding for my reflections today. So um, I will be speaking personally, but there's data behind it. And we are developing that online resource for red black spirit medicine in the Chesapeake. Um, and I will go um, into what I mean when I talk about red black spirit medicine um, a little bit uh, later on. Um, it's also important to note that we have lots and lots of photographs of mixed race people from um, the Virginia coastal region. And um, we are our own artifacts in a certain sense. Now I'll begin with the personal reflection. My story is, uh, oh, I wanted to show you something first, actually. Let please allow me to share one image with you. This is um, uh, a representation of the queen of the Pamunkey Indians. Most of these tribes were uh, matrilineal and matriarchal, the Oak included. And um, uh, the queen of the Oak signed uh, a treaty uh, with the English. I don't want to quote the exact year. I think it was 1622, but I, I, I didn't check that for this presentation. But we might imagine that um, ancestors from Africa and ancestors from um, Native America might have had a certain resonance among them. And this is by Rose Powhatan, um, um, a, a Native artist um, who is um, part of the ongoing conversation. So I'm just gonna leave this up for a moment because in a way, um, I'd like you to meditate on that image as you hear my story. My story is personal at the same time representative of the spiritual journey of many persons of mixed triracial or red black heritage. Perhaps for me, it begins in my childhood in Prince George's County, Maryland, on the banks of a stream that fed the Anacostia River. Long before I ever thought about being a scholar of African-American literature and culture. When I was a child, we lived in a house in the woods, just on the banks of Indian Creek. The boundary between our black and mixed race community and another world, a world that was largely white. But throughout this region, 
in the time before there was a beltway. There were communities like ours with tightly interwoven kinship relations. My father taught me how to cup my hands to drink from a metal bucket or a clear spring, how to set traps for rabbits and how to find the North Star. The older men moved like shadows in and out of the forest, emerging with squirrel, rabbits, or occasionally other game. I roamed the woods and the wetlands, watchful for water moccasins and dangerous sinkholes. We farmed the land, growing corn, beans, squash, and occasionally melon. We caught and cooked the eels from Indian Creek frying them up in hot grease to eat with hominy and succotash. In the spring, my father's mother would prepare a physic of pokeweed, a poisonous plant that I learned to pick before its purple berries formed. And dad would head down into Southern Maryland with my mother's Gus and Butler cousins for the spring herring run. Dad and cousin Amos caught lots of herring and they salted them down and preserved them in a barrel. Only later did I learn that the food practices of the family, such as the salting of herring and the growing of the three sisters were tangible signs of the cultural interaction of red and black people. My mother's mother was a red brick brown woman who could heal many ailments with plants from the forest. This she learned from her grandmother, Nana, who, as my grandmother told me, had long black hair, long enough to sit on. From my paternal grandmother, I learned about my great-great-grandfather, Peyton Harrison, Black and Indian, who came up from Virginia. He told my grandmother that his people were some of the Jamestown Africans. Sometimes, as I roamed the woods or dug clay from the stream bank, I did wonder where the Indians for whom Indian Creek was named had gone. Where had the Indians gone? But then my mind would return to the present and the pending threat of integration, which had not yet occurred, but was looming over us. In those days, colored children from PG from Southern Prince George's County, came all the way up to Lakeland to attend our colored Lakeland school. No one was black then. <clears throat> we were all colored with a capital C. Call somebody black, you're gonna start a fight. Those Proctor children, they didn't associate with us much. We thought they were strange with their straight hair and standoff ways. Only recently did I learn that many of the Proctors now self-identify as Piscataway Indians, and surely some of them are my cousins. And only when urban renewal conspired to take what I thought of as our land there on Indian Creek, did I begin to appreciate the convergence of the things I had seen and the stories I had heard. It was these stories of my ancestors in the Chesapeake that fueled my desire to learn more about the wine oak, both as a scholar and as a symbolic descendant. <clears throat> In time, I learned that wine oak is at once a people, a place or places, an incorporated association <clears throat> and ritual ground where the collective historical trauma of colonialism, the enslavement of Black and Native people, and the trauma and separation and exclusion gets repaired. Let me repeat that because I stumbled and it's important. The concept is important. In time, I learned that Wine Oak is at once a people, a place for places, an incorporated association and ritual ground 
where the collective historical trauma of colonialism, the enslavement of black and native people and the trauma of separation and exclusion gets repaired through collective healing prayers, music, ritual, and the intentional coming together of persons prepared to celebrate red black connections. The name wine oak itself means sassafras, a medicinal tree used for healing purposes by indigenous people, transported Africans and European colonists alike. And today, the Wine Oak Association is first and foremost a site of healing. The Chesapeake or Great Shellfish Bay was the site of the Wine Oak Plantation in Virginia, where the first Africans in the English Americas lived in community dating from 1619. Transported to the Chesapeake region through Point Comfort, Virginia, near present day Hampton, and from thence to Jamestown, and from there on to the Wine Oak Plantation, named for the indigenous people nearby, the 1619 Angolan Africans began their lives in close proximity to the Wine Oak people, whose ancestors had been in the region for at least 1600 years before the English colonizers arrived. The Africans learned to hunt and fish with the wine oak, lighting fires in their canoes at night to warm their hands and attract fish. There were many similarities between the indigenous red people and the transported Africans. Each was subjected to colonialism, social disorder, and upheaval for hundreds of years and to being called savages. The object of this immense and intense cultural interaction and its resultant degradation, as the Wine Oak Association points out, was to take the red man's land and use the black man's labor to work that land from the Wine Oak website. On the positive side, the indigenous people and Africans alike had oral traditions that allowed for the preservation of ancestry and records and for the conveying of identity and knowledge through the cultivation of deep listening skills and respect for elders. These were skills that could spell the difference between physical survival and annihilation. As folkways had the power to give direction and guidance from ancestral knowledge, even when the ancestor was not physically present. And in many ways, the African spirituality and cosmology may have been compatible with that of their original indigenous hosts along with their musical traditions and practices of midwifery, herbology, and other forms of traditional healing. Both peoples had priests, conjurers, diviners, healers, and midwives. Each had a closeness and an interdependent relationship to the land. By following the language of the way that Black and red people are described in colonial Virginia laws. It is possible to see how ideas of race changed over time and were used as tools to divide two people who had much in common, as documented by Erica Coleman in her award-winning book, That the Blood Stay Pure, African Americans, Native Americans, and the Predicament of Identity in Virginia, relations between indigenous persons and persons of African descent of, in Virginia have often been troubled with Virginia's Racial Purity Act disrupting relationships among individuals, families, churches, and tribes. This is personal. Today, the Wine Oak Association founded by Hugh and Anita Harrell of Hampton in 1999 on the 300 
80th anniversary of the landing of Africans in Virginia has become a site of memory and spiritual healing for those simultaneously remembering, navigating, and reconciling with this rich and complicated past. In 2017, I was named a warrior of the Wine Oak Association. When I speak of red black spirit medicine, I am speaking of medicine that originates with black or red people, that is good for black red people or anyone who needs the physical, emotional, or psychological care that red black spirit medicine can provide. Think of it as complementary care for the body, mind, and spirit. Think of it as redress, to use Sadia Hartman's term, or soul repair for the intersecting layers of violence and historical trauma and spirit murder, to borrow from the work of Nell Painter and later Kelly Brown Douglas. The work of Jack Saul has shown that collective trauma is often best addressed in community with others. Collective trauma is often best addressed in community with others. This is what the Wine Oak Association achieves in its annual coming together gatherings and powwows. The healing may impact physical health or just the spirit. I felt that healing personality when brother Hugh Harrell poured a fresh pot of sassafras tea and we sat down in a home rich with art and ritual objects from both African and indigenous culture. And Anita Harrell read her poem, It Isn't Identity Politics. We honor Hugh and Anita. She writes, I am Anita Harrell. I am moon dancer. I am the daughter of Aline Davis Allen. I am the daughter of Annie Miles Davis Heron. I am the great granddaughter of Annie Smith Miles. I am the great great granddaughter of Lavinia Smith. Because of them, I am Shoshone. Because of them, I am love. Because of them, I am strong. Because of them, I am who I say I am. I am Moon Dancer. I am Anita Harrell. Who are you? And then over this pot of sassafras tea, Anita said, if you use a blood quantum approach, you are essentially committing suicide. Hugh, a descendant of many generations of Charles City County Red Blacks agrees. Quote, we've been doing what we've been doing because we had to. There's no emphasis in local schools on teaching children their history. Anita added, I know Erica started her work after coming to one of our gatherings. This is Dr. Erica Coleman um, and the book that the blood stay pure. I know that Erica started her work after coming to one of our gatherings. There's an alignment with the ancestors, things happening beyond our control, end quote. Each year on the second Saturday in August to coincide with the anniversary of the first Africans in Virginia, the Wine Oak Association sponsors the Coming Together Festival, the link and legacy of Native and African Americans. To embark 
on a journey to a wine oak coming together festival, one must leave physically the spaces and places of colonization to go into the wilderness, up into the woods in Charles City County or Surrey County, into historically red and black spaces. One leaves Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy or Colonial Williamsburg, literally and historically the colonial capital. From Williamsburg, one drives west on Route 5 past Wine Oak Plantation, where Yardley hid most of the 19 Angolan Africans who were imported illegally into Jamestown in 1619. And on past the Berkeley Plantation, where Benjamin Harrison traded extensively with indigenous people. And some Wine Oak people lived in houses that Harrison, on that Harrison property, there on the Wine Oak Peninsula, just about five miles from the place where the indentured Africans formed their first community. In fact, many of the coming together gatherings have been held at the Harrison Na National Fish Hatcheries, part of the original Harrison estate, which keeps the historical continuities tight. To go to coming together, one travels through green spaces and through symbolic geography and psychic landscapes to become removed, sheltered, and inoculated. To claim and to be reclaimed. Once arrived, the healing can begin in large and small spaces where the mind can begin to be decolonized and everyone is invited to break bread and enjoy the transcendent rhythms of sacred drums, healing songs and chants, processions honoring the ancestors and dancing. The protocol of coming together includes both African and native elements. Everyone is welcome, but one must be intentional about the choice to make the journey, to go there. Walking in a wine oak procession and hearing the transcendent rhythms of two cultures can be a powerful source of connection and renewal, especially for one with red, black roots. There is medicine in the knowledge shared, in the smudging, in the libations, in the prayers, food, in the belonging. For me, the Who's Afraid of Black Indians poems of Wine Oak Association member Shonda Buchanan are restorative, not unlike the narrative medicine that I've taught at William and Mary and at Eastern Virginia Medical School. There is more medicine in the photographs of Faith Charity Nelson and the Lena Dismukes and the paintings of Rose Powhatan one of which you saw earlier, and Chief Lynette Alston, who is also an artist. Beyond this, Anita Harrell has taken her healing rituals into her work as a family systems constellation therapy facilitator. And similar therapies were employed at a Braxton Institute advanced training seminar for 100 helpers and healers seeking training in moral injury and collective healing in September 2017 at Princeton Theological Seminary. To conclude, African American and Native American healers have access to knowledge, culture, and power when we stand in our own medicine and our own truth. I conclude with a prayer from the Wine Oak Association website. We give thanks to Creator for each new day. We give thanks to the ancestors who watch over us. We give thanks to our Mother Earth who sustains us. We give thanks to our brothers and sisters, the plants and animals 
who give their lives so that ours may continue. We give thanks to the people whose work, care, and love nourish us. We give thanks to Akubalon and Turtle Island that meet in us. We give thanks to Creator for all these gifts. May they be transformed into positive thoughts, careful and kind words, appropriate and effective deeds. Aho, Ashe, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, for transporting us, and taking us to this wonderful journey and connecting us. Um, and now I will have uh, my colleague Linda to take us to talk about the, the midwives who have held the community together and nurtured it along on this journey. And I will share your uh, PowerPoint, Linda. Thank you, Nick. Yes. Um, for that introduction. And um, Joanne, thank you also um, for your in depth um, conversation regarding rituals and spirituality um, here in Virginia. So, I'm going to be talking about um, African American midwives um, and their contributions um, in terms of health, in terms of community not only in Virginia, but I will also be reflecting on the research that I did that goes back to 1981, when I was working with the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey um, in an administrative program, in, in an administrative position with a nurse midwife educational program. And one of the things that struck me at the time was that when nurse midwives were, this is now 1970s, when nurse midwives were talking about the history of midwifery in America, the story begins with um, the horseback riding nurse midwives from Appalachia, Kentucky in the 1930s. But the history of Native American, immigrant midwives, African American midwives um, at that time was not a part of the nurse midwifery curriculum. And so that's what sparked my interest in um, going to Alabama in 1981 to interview traditional African-American midwives because having um, been to Selma as a part of the civil rights activism, I knew that many of the women um, there had stories to tell about the midwives who were their birth attendants. The next slide. Shall I click that, Maybe um, you can t change the slide or should I change it? I'm not sure, let's see. Can you hear me, McBib? I'm wanting to change the slide. Okay, thanks. So the focus um, this morning has to do with more recent work that I've been doing. It's become kind of my um, lifetime work um, with many other um, roads coming in between, um, writing, um, working with public health. Um, and as I mentioned, the nurse midwife program. Um, I'm now living in Hampton, Virginia. Um, but I have decided that a lot of the reasons why um, the granny midwives as they're often referred to in um, the medical literature were not included as part of nurse midwifery history or dignified in medical history was because of some of the perceptions that have been sustained and um, promoted by the dominant uh, medical groups that granny midwives were backwards they were ignorant, 
they were superstitious, um, and that they needed to be done away with and that the appropriate place for birth was with a doctor in a hospital. And I, in 1981, when I had this fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities, I actually went to Alabama and interviewed midwives and learned about their stories and learned about their traditions and learned about their rituals. And I left with a sense of their timeless wisdom was definitely in, in needs to be recognized and needs to be honored. Um, I actually curated an exhibition at the um, Smithsonian Anacostia Museum back in um, about 15 years ago now, uh, looking at the images and looking at the stories of traditional African-American midwives. And one of those um, stories is actually now part of the African-American History Museum that recently opened up in Washington, DC. But I was really interested in making this link in terms of trying to understand these uh, practices that I saw as traditions and rituals and that were being described in the medical literature as ignorant backwards and um, needed to be dismantled. You know, where, where were these um, traditions? What was the base of these traditions? Where were these ideas about best practices within the African-American community? Where were they rooted? And so clearly, um, you know, Joanne's been talking about Native American, but my focus has been on looking at some of the traditions and rituals in Africa and seeing whether there were some parallels, whether there were some connections. And I literally adopted the go back and get it Sankofa idea uh, in 2019 and traveled to Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, and Ghana and was there for six weeks and had the very good fortune to interview traditional midwives. Um, the United Nations uh, refers to traditional midwives in Africa primarily as traditional birth attendants. But I had an opportunity to record interviews and to see some of the parallels between the practices in um, the South, in Virginia, um, and how they connected with some of the practices um, on the continent. Maybe if you can go to the next slide. So this um, traditional midwife is in Waleta Soto in Ethiopia, which um, I, I flew there from Addis, but it, I, I understand if you're driving or if you're on a bus, which is how most people would be traveling to Addis, it's about a five hour drive south. Um, this is her village. Um, you see that she's um, holding an herb plant in her hand. And one of the traditions that the midwives talk about, um, African American midwives talk about in Virginia, in Alabama, is the use of plant medicine. Um, ginger tea was one of the teas that um, some midwives in, this, in, in uh, Virginia have mentioned in terms of uh, promoting labor, for example. But when I asked this particular midwife, you know, did she use any herbs in her practices? Um, she immediately pointed out to a, one of her grandchildren and said, pointing to the garden said, oh, you know, please go to the garden and bring this particular herb. And she immediately started talking about how she used this particular herb in her practice uh, to promote labor. Now she is, very, very um, typical in many ways of midwives in the States in that she is a lineage midwife. Her mother was a midwife. Her grandmother was a midwife. I've interviewed midwives in Alabama whose great grandmothers were midwives and great, great grandmothers who were midwives in the era of enslavement. But one of the connecting factors is the knowledge um, and the, what I would consider um, uh, through their own method of research, um, understanding of how particular herbs and plants can be used um, during uh, labor and birth. And those um, are among the practices that have been continued. The next slide. So 
you know, traditions and rituals, um, that, that is a, um, you know, I, I'm still in the research process. I'm, I'm now um, doing more in-depth research in Virginia as a Virginia Humanities Fellow. Um, and we'll be doing um, interviews with midwife descendants in the Hampton Roads area over the summer. Um, but in terms of traditions and rituals, one of the more fascinating ones for me when I was doing work in Alabama, and some of these rituals are described in um, a book that I did with one of the midwives that I interviewed, Margaret Charles Smith, called Listen to Me Good, um, where she talks about some of these traditions. But one of them was what they would call a taking up ceremony. And that would be to go back to the uh, home where the baby was born and where they had attended the birth with supporting the mother. And um, this could be, normally it would be like seven or nine days after the birth. And they would literally, the mother would literally um, with the support of the midwife carry the baby around the house a specific number of, the, of times outdoors. It's kind of like an outdooring ceremony. And I cannot tell you the number of descriptions and some of them vary um, depending on the, uh, the, the indigenous group that I was speaking with in Ghana or Ethiopia or Kenya, but many of them had practices of outdooring, of naming ceremonies. Um, and some of them, as we know, uh, the tradition that's now being carried out here in the States among many African-Americans, but this celebratory idea but this idea of taking the mother up is something that was sustained by traditional African-American midwives uh, in the States and survived the trauma of, um, of the era of enslavement. Um, other rituals include burial of the afterbirth, um, the placenta, um, the, um, the sense of wanting to provide an environment of protection and restoration in the days immediately following birth. And also this whole idea of um, extended care, which we're beginning to see again being supported. I know ODU, um, Old Dominion University has a program that uh, it's a training program for doulas um, because there's now recognition that in terms of even addressing problems like equity and health disparities and improving outcomes, that having support um, in terms of whatever is needed in terms of spiritual support, but also the, the midwives would go back with food. <laughs> they would go back and bathe the babies. Um, they were very much not about um, the care ending at the time of birth. Spiritual connections, um, on the continent, um, the birthing space was definitely a spiritual space. Um, invocations, calling on the ancestors, um, bringing down the spirits um, in the context of the African-American experience. Um, in Virginia, prayer, the midwives would say, they wouldn't go out their door to go to a birth without praying first. Many of them took their Bibles with them. Um, they, the, the midwife that you saw in Ethiopia, when I asked her how many babies she had delivered, she literally said that she thought it was a sin to count the babies that she delivered because she didn't believe that she delivered the babies. It was God, it was uh, a spiritual event. Um, that made uh, this um, beautiful um, coming into the world uh, possible. Um, and, and this is, you know, time immemorial. Um, in Egypt, um, we see this um, idea of the goddesses um, uh, being present for the, for the birthing experience. And I've already talked a little bit about, about plant medicine. So let's move to the next slide. I wanna make sure we have time for questions and conversation at the end. Biddy Mason is a legendary midwife. And I bring her up as an example um, 
the Norfolk Journal and Guide, which is the leading um, newspaper in um, and still uh, publishes, I believe, in, in Hampton, Norfolk area, um, has had, I was just beginning to look at the number of articles that have, were published um, in the Norfolk Journal and Guide about church services celebrating and honoring midwives, um, about um, feature stories where they are actually telling the biographical story of midwives. But Biddy Mason actually now has a, a national presence. She was born in the era of, um, of, of the era of enslavement in Georgia in the uh, early 1800s. And she um, was uh, the plantation owner moved west to, uh, to California. And she is legendary because she, uh, as a midwife and as a nurse, um, she learned her skills from her mother. Um, she was a very uh, important midwife in uh, the Los Angeles area, but she was also a community leader. She was the uh, founder of the first um, African uh, AME uh, Methodist Episcopal Church in Los Angeles. There is a park um, named for uh, Biddy Mason in, in LA. Um, she, um, the last time I read her about her was actually last year, last summer, um, when the New York Times had an article about Biddy Mason, businesswoman, community leader, community pillar, um, being pictured on a WPA mural in a university on a university wall and there was uh, renovations going on. And I think it's, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly, it was an anthropology student who happened to have been sitting in the uh, lecture hall watching this dismantling going on, who said, wait a minute, let's find out who's on this uh, image that you're taking down um, and it will be lost. And, and so it turned out it was an image of, and the New York Times reported this, an image of Biddy Mason with a white doctor um, caring for a malaria patient um, in California. So her extended midwifery care as a nurse um, and, and, and extending that care in many ways as a, as a, as a healer. Um, a lot of folks that I talked to um, who remembered midwives in their community growing up said, we didn't think of them as midwives, we thought of them as doctors. They had their little black mat bag. And if anyone got sick, whether it was the baby who was sick or whether it was the mother, it was the, the midwife that we called on. But I like this image of Biddy Mason because we often think of the midwife um, not as a businesswoman, right? But Biddy Mason um, actually was a very uh, smart businesswoman. And in um, Hampton Roads, I, when I was working as a curator at the Portsmouth Community Color Library Museum, I also had an opportunity to interview some of the descendants of midwives there. And again, many of them were community leaders in their churches. Um, some of them were teachers of midwives. The next slide, please. Um, there should be an image. Oh, okay. So we're now in the um, in the Jim Crow era, and I think it's important to understand that in terms of the history of midwives, midwives were lifesavers. Um, hospital-based care. But it's also important to point out that even when there was access to hospital-based care, there were many African-American women and white women who were still choosing midwives until 
states um, like Alabama and like Virginia um, stop licensing uh, lay midwives and actually licensing lay midwives is only recently resumed. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I've talked a bit about midwives being honored and respected in their communities as um, members of organizations, a founder of an important uh, of church in California, um, teachers. There are many, there were midwives in, um, in a midwife in Portsmouth who was also a teacher. And when I talked to a midwife in Alabama about that, I said, how could you do this? And she said, well, you know, she worked it out with the superintendent that um, if she had to go to a birth, she would just have to go to the birth. That was her priority. But what is significant about it to me is that, so there were some of the mothers in her class, she might've actually delivered, right? And then she might've been taking care of other mothers who cho whose children became her students. So that this idea about being really community-based and linked to community, you know, through her teaching or linked to the community through this new um, Mrs. Jones, uh, not only as a birth attendant, but they knew them as the uh, president of the church choir, a member of the missionary group, as a school teacher, um, as, a, as a community leader. The image here is from um, a documentary film that was made in the 1950s in Georgia called All My Babies. And it has now been preserved by the Library of Congress as one of the documentaries to be preserved for all time. And I first found out about this film because it was being shown to doctors <coughs> at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey as an example of what used to be. And now this film is being celebrated as what can continue to be. Um, the next slide. I love this image of um, Toni Morrison, um, who is a Pulitzer Prize um, winning writer. Um, her great great grandmother um, was a midwife. And one of the, um, there's been a sense that midwives were not honored and respected in their communities because we don't have documentation of that from the medical journals and the professional journals. But in fact, the honoring and the respect for traditional African-American midwives in communities, coastal communities in Virginia and across the South has been going on for generations. Tony Morrison said that whenever her great-great-grandmother walked into the room, all the men would stand up. Um, the image that you saw of the mother and the baby from the film, All My Babies, I spoke to um, Mrs. Coley's um, grandson who I interviewed. And he said, whenever she walked down the road or down, it would take her like um, an hour to walk a block because everyone was stopping her for advice for information, for um, uh, like she was the counselor, right? The doctor, the counselor, the plant doctor, the baby doctor, <laughs> all kind of rolled into one. And also um, Chester Higgins, a photographer at, that some of you may be familiar with, he talks about his aunt Shook, who was a midwife. And whenever she walked into church, the congregation stood up and when people walked by her house, they would bow. Um, but she was also the person that they would, that his family and other community members would call on, kind of like for hospice care, right? Um, so seeing these multiple roles of the, of the midwife is important. And, and Toni Morrison said that she felt 
the authority of these midwives more than she felt her own authority. Next slide. Um, hi, this is Patty. I just have to jump in here because I'm concerned sure. about all the panelists. And I just wanted to make I am, a You know, guess what? This is the last slide. Uh, perfect timing. OK, thank you. <laughs> and the only, and I can be very, very, um, yeah, because I really want the conversation to happen. That's so important. Yeah. So yeah. I, the reason this last slide is there is because I don't want, I don't ever want this to be seen as a, history, a, a history story, right? This, the issue of inequities, disparity, disparities in um, uh, health outcomes, as we know from the Serena story who had challenges, almost lost her baby, Beyonce had challenges. I think it was Serena's life that was really at stake. Um, that there are lessons to be learned and that doulas and um, midwives are continuing uh, to, with these practices. And I think they are beginning more so, the American College of Nurse Midwives has invited Angela Davis as their keynote speaker, and they're doing a lot more about activism and recognizing lessons learned from these uh, community-based midwives who have given so much to their communities. All right, thank you. <laughs> and, and thank you for letting me know about the time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Linda, this was a, another wonderful journey. Thank you, we appreciate it. Uh, and now we have um, Barbara Hamli to, uh, to tell us about how she's engaging voices in, the, um, in, our, in our midst in Hampton Roads. Uh, Barbara, do I share yours or uh, are you I can sharing do it. it? I can do it for you, McVeigh. You will do it, it right okay. now. Perfect. I'll bring Thank it up you so much. When I need it, okay? Thank you, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning. And to my uh, previous colleagues, I've learned so much from you, so I appreciate the opportunity to participate. My name is Barbara Ham Lee, and I'm the executive producer and host of a radio show called Another View. It airs on the NBC, uh, NBC the NPR uh, station WHRB FM in Hampton Roads, Virginia. It covers everything from Williamsburg North to North to Northeastern North Carolina and the Eastern Shore of Virginia and of course the seven cities within Hampton Roads. So we cover all of Eastern Virginia in our programming. Um, another view is very unusual because we unabashedly tell you that we discuss today's issues from an African-American perspective. We're on every Thursday at noon, um, and I want to give you a little bit of background as to how the show started, and then I'm going to play a clip, so I'm going to not talk for a long time because I'd like for you to actually experience some of the show. Back in 2007, uh, the new, newly brought on general manager, whose name is Bert Schmidt, <clears throat> uh, looked at all of the programming that at that time was on television. And uh, the Hampton Roads area is about 45, 48% African American, a uh, significant um, uh, population in our area. And his, his thought was, you know, why don't we have programming, something that really appeals to the African American community? Now, this was on PBS, uh, WHRO Public Media is radio and television. And so he charged me with coming up with uh, a show that would air on television that would celebrate uh, and also discuss the issues facing the African-American community. I sent invitations to 100 community leaders through, from throughout Hampton Roads, uh, and about 60 people took us up on our two-hour lunch offer to come in and help us to shape the show. And as you can imagine, we got everything from a, an amazing race, Hampton Road style, to cooking shows, to talk shows. It ran the gamut. And then we had to come down to reality, which was, here's the budget. <laughs> so uh, the community group said, you know what? We would love to have you do a talk show, and that's fine. The one thing that is really, really important to us is that we always have something positive happening in the African-American community. My producer and I um, were very excited about being able to do this show because we knew that from commercial television, from which my background comes, uh, a lot of times the stereotypes and the images that you see of African Americans are not necessarily reflective of the community. And so we wanted to be able to showcase that as well as discuss the very serious issues that uh, plague uh, people of color 
in our community. So we started another view. It was a 30 minute television show for a year and a half. Uh, and then WHRO um, experienced as many uh, public uh, radio and TV stations in Virginia, uh, massive cuts from state funding. And so we stopped doing local television productions. There happened to be a slot available on radio. And I pitched the idea of moving another view to radio. Um, if you know anything about public TV and public radio, uh, on public television, you have more people of color watching. Number one, it's easy to access. Number two, it has Sesame Street and all the other children's programming uh, that a lot of people utilize with their young kids um, and the documentaries and so forth. Not so much for NPR. Uh, NPR had a very uh, specific audience that was predominantly white, uh, and there was quite a bit of pushback from the station, uh, from people in the station, from other managers saying, you know, we don't think this is going to work for radio, that people really don't want to hear what the what is going on in the African-American community. They really don't want to know what the issues are. Well, we decided to try it anyway, see, do a trial run, see how that happens. That was in 2011, July of 2011, when we first went on radio. We are now celebrating our 10th year on the radio. And people, my audience is predominantly non-African American. And people tell me all the time, it is an opportunity to listen to a conversation that I normally would not be privy to. And so we don't pull punches on another view. I'd like to play a clip and if you just give me a moment to start to share my screen. I will play a clip from you. Um, while I pull it up, let me set up the premise behind the show, behind this particular show. We do, just one second. Uh, okay, I am having a bit of a problem here. There we go. Um, You're okay. Uh, yes, I'm just trying to get to. Oh, 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 oh! I know what I'm doing wrong. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. No. Uh, okay, there we go. Now, so this show. Um, one thing that we do. Um, on the show is we have what we call the Another View Roundtable, and. The round table is on once a month, and it is consists of four women. Um, two are uh, baby boomers, one is a Gen Xer, and one is a millennial. And we talk about a variety of issues that are going on. That air show airs on the second uh, Thursday of each month. Uh, one is a um, uh, elected politician. One is a relationship expert. One is a political science professor from Norfolk State University. And one is a clean comedian and entrepreneur. So we have a variety of, of perspectives on the topics that we discuss. What the clip I'm going to play for you uh, is from last week's, this month's Another View, where we were talking about the bombshell interview between Oprah and um, Harry and Meghan. And so I want to play a quick clip. It's about five minutes in length, but I think that you will find it interesting and entertaining. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. For as much as we talk... Uh-oh. Oh, my. I don't know what I did. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. For as much as we talk about race and racism in this country, it was still shocking to hear the bombshell revealed during the interview between Oprah and Meghan Markle. The revelation that someone within the royal family was concerned about how dark would be the skin of the firstborn of the royal couple. It was a jolting reminder that racism is alive and well across the globe. That's just one of the topics for the Another View Roundtable. Alvy and Lyons, Don Hester, Carol Pretlow and Allison Moore are back and ready to take on that issue along with legalizing marijuana in Virginia and habits you will keep and get rid of in terms of pandemic living. Stay tuned. Another View will be right back 
after this news from NPR. So I got an email last night from a listener who requests to remain anonymous, but I'm going to read part of the email as a question that uh, this listener has. And he or she said, people of darker skin tones daily encounter and face discrimination and acts of racism. In a family setting, is it reasonable to discuss the likelihood a child being born into your family will have a darker skin tone, which may make the child a subject of racism and discrimination? Is it possible this could have been the nature of the inquiry, concern about what difficulties the child may face in life? So the question I have been pondering is, without knowing motivation, is curiosity about the skin tone of an unborn child absolutely racist in and of itself? Alvy, and I'm coming to you first. I think that there are a couple of things that are at play inside of this, okay? So one, I think that it is disingenuous for us to pretend that a monarchy that has existed for hundreds of years in, you know, unfortunately white colonialism, you know, does not have a bent towards racism. Even you know, though I they had two black queens. <laughs> just, I just think, it, you know, I think it's a little disingenuous to, to think yeah. that that would not be a factor. OK, now, do I believe that where people start and where people end is the same place? Absolutely not. If you knew anything about my personal world and the people that I love, you will know that I can meet you where you are and I could love you to where you're capable of being. So I don't hold it against anyone where they start. I hold it against people when they don't want to move from where they start. OK, um, so in this conversation, could there have been discussion that is genuine curiosity and attempt to understand when you've not been exposed to race, that when you add a drop of chocolate into anything, yes, it is sweeter and it's darker. You know, like the that is a reality that comes with us. We have a dominant gene and it changes everything. And if you're uninformed, it is a, it's appropriate to ask questions. The thing is that I think that Harry loves his family well enough to recognize when it was a question of curiosity and understanding versus something that made him so uncomfortable that he's unwilling to even acknowledge any content inside of that exchange. I don't think he would have felt like he needed to talk to Megan about it in that kind of way if he wasn't himself able to tap into an ugliness inside of the conversation that made him uncomfortable. So is the inquiry by itself inherently racist? No, curiosity is not inherently racist. I think that the issue inside of this is that Harry knows his family well enough to know what was behind and around and inside of what was being said. And that's what made him feel like his family was unprotected and that he, as a father and a husband, had to protect them by stepping out and taking matters into his own hands. So I do think it's important to parse those two things out. But I don't think in this scenario we were having a conversation about curiosity and attempt to understand cultural dynamics. I don't think that that was it at all. Mm-hmm. Well, and the, the the fact that it happened in, in context of also taking away the child's title, taking away the security for the baby. Um, Allison, did you see the interview? And, and since you were on that show that we um, won an award for, uh, for on colorism, I'm curious as to whether what your reaction was to even hear that somebody would verbalize it that way. Um, as you know, from that episode, colorism is definitely a thing that i um, passionate about our community overcoming, understanding and overcoming, right? So it was a trigger for me but it was not at all surprising. Um, it just, I was not surprised that they had conversations about this baby being looking too black. I mean, it just, it, I was surprised that Oprah was surprised, if that makes sense. <laughs> but um, no. And so I'm with Alvin, like, is the conversation in itself, is the question in itself racist? Well, actually, a question in itself isn't racist anyway. We want to define what racism is. But, again, the context in which the, which the question was asked, and who? <laughs> it ain't want nobody black in the room. Why are we talking about somebody complex if it ain't none of y'all black? So that in itself already gives it cringy, right? And it just lets me know. Um, 
and for the person who asked the question, you know, it, it's just, come on now. That, that's what I would say. Come on, ma'am, sir, come on now. So as you can see, um, we hold no punches on another view, and the conversation is lively, it's insightful. Um, we hope to educate and, and as well as entertain, because that's how people learn. And I will stop talking because we have two other colleagues, and I know we're running out of time. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Barbara, for a great clip and you know a great exposure to what, what, um, what we have on the radio. Um, and now, um, Abby Santo, please uh, join us. And sorry for you know how quick we're running out of time, um, but Abby, please, uh, it's all it's all yours. Thank you, McBib, and uh, thank you everybody uh, who has presented so far. It's been a wonderful panel. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh no, not now. We can't hear you at all now. Now you're muted. Turn it the other way. It's all the way up. I'm okay, now. Coming in and out. Am I good? You're, you're good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, my, my microphone is all the way up, so uh, we'll just go with that. Uh, my name is Dr. Abby Santo. I am the chair of the Department of Communication and Theater Arts at Old Dominion University. I'll be talking today about a project that I was involved in uh, in my previous position at ODU when I was the director of the Institute for the Humanities there. Uh, and it's an ongoing project, but I will talk about some of the challenges of an ongoing project of this sort. Uh, the project I'm specifically talking about is called Mapping Lambert's Point. And uh, for context, for those of us in the room who are not from the Hampton Roads area, Lambert's Point is one of the oldest African-American neighborhoods in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, it's one of the first neighborhoods where African-Americans were allowed to own their own homes. Uh, and it is a neighborhood that is just adjacent to Old Dominion University. Uh, in fact, at this point in time, half of the campus is built on top of uh, what was previously Lambert's Point. And the project was, uh, so the, that, that background is really key to understanding the nature of this project. Many of the residents of Lambert's Point uh, both those who continue to live in the neighborhood, but many as well who resided in this neighborhood uh, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s have very complicated and uh, sometimes distrusting relationship with the university because the perception is that Old Dominion University uh, conspired with the banks, with the city, uh, with other organizations to essentially uh, force, force residents out and to build on top of this neighborhood. Uh, Lambert's Point, while it is a really old and really important neighborhood in the city, I should point out, it's often been a lower middle class neighborhood, which means that it doesn't have the markings of uh, place in it that often get, often get preserved by national historical societies. It doesn't have great monuments or classic buildings. And so as a result, even though it had and continues to have several really significant spaces in it that were essential to the community's identity, uh, there was really no issue with bulldozing those places over and building on top of them, uh, or at the very least, no effort or consideration was made about whether or not that was appropriate. So many folks who grew up in that neighborhood, many folks whose families grew up in that neighborhood, many folks who uh, feel deeply connected to that neighborhood feel as though there's almost nothing left of that neighborhood that captures a sense of place, that captures their history, the culture of that community uh, that preserves it and that communicates and shares that culture and history with future generations of people who are going to live in that neighborhood uh, or are going to go to school in that neighborhood, et cetera. So the genesis of the project really came from a desire to figure out how we could collect stories from long-term residents of this neighborhood and using emergence, uh, emerging digital tools and technologies uh, embed those stories in a virtual map of the neighborhood that could essentially capture the, uh, preserve the stories of place and make these stories available to this generation and future generations so that even as the physical contours of the neighborhood changed, uh, these stories would live on uh, with a hope and an understanding that this would in turn uh, help 
preserve a sense of place for residents, but also provide a voice to a community that often feels as though their stories are not fully heard uh, or not fully listened to. And so the goal was to collaborate with residents of this neighborhood to create this platform, which could in hopefully amplify their voices and create pathways for them to uh, gain greater authority and autonomy over how they wanted their neighborhood to look moving forward. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm gonna run through a PowerPoint very quickly and selectively just to kind of give you a glimpse of a couple of things. It's hard to talk about a digital mapping project and not show you maps. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but this will be quite selective in terms of how I do it just for the sake of um, wanting to keep everything, everything on track. So as I said, Lambert's Point is a very old neighborhood. Uh, these are some early maps that kind of give you a sense of where that community is. Um, I like this one in particular because the map on the uh, right shows you the neighborhood and its residencies going all the way to 49th Street in Norfolk. Uh, the map on the left, uh, this aerial view, uh, you know, is basically fairly contemporary it's from 2014 or 15, I believe. And it shows you, if you look at the top third quadrant of that map, you see Old Dominion University, right? So you can see how almost a third of the neighborhood has just been engulfed and enveloped by the university over the course of the last 30 or 40 years. The project was funded through money that came from the Norfolk Southern Foundation, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, and it involved collaborations with the city of Norfolk's Parks and Rec uh, Services, as well as with the Lambert's Point Civic League, as well as with members of the advisory board for the Institute for the Humanities, which includes Barbara Hamley, uh, you know, who were active in helping us sort of put all this together. I want to introduce these key ideas right now because they are important to the narrative I want to tell. Uh, they were issues that we went into and encountered and were aware that we would encounter early on, and they're issues that ultimately plagued the project in some ways throughout and continue to plague it, right? We were very aware that there was going to be a concern over trust, how to build trust, how to establish trust, uh, that in a, with a community that felt as though the university had taken so many of their uh, places away from them, the concern was that the university was now coming in and wanting to take their stories as well. And who would and figuring out how ownership over those stories would work if there was any ownership of it, and what the motivations behind our project were, what the transparency, you know, that we needed to be incredibly transparent about what we were doing. And it took a long time to establish trust, uh, involving multiple over really over the course of two years of multiple of attending regularly attending civic league meetings, and basically being willing to listen to the concerns and frustrations and hearing those concerns and frustrations throughout uh, to try and establish trust um, and to try and basically be clear of saying, you know, this was not an attempt to give back the land uh, that unfortunately, you know, I do not have the power to do, uh, that this was truly an attempt to really just sort of help create a space where those stories could live on. Technology was a concern, uh, you know, how could we build this platform? We had very limited amounts of money but also that the community itself had moved from a lower middle class to a working poor community by the time we were working on this project, which meant that a lot of the residents of that community, particularly its senior residents, often didn't have access to a computer at home or reliable internet at home. And so in creating a digital mapping project, one of the major questions was, would the community itself truly be able to access this resource? Uh, we ended up collaborating with the Lambert's Point Community Center and putting a kiosk in that space to make sure that residents could continue to have access, but that remained an issue throughout. Transferal and sustainability. The goal of the project was for us to lead a team in collecting stories and building the initial platform, but ultimately to pass the project on to the community itself so that they would essentially be the custodians of it uh, and continue to leave, keep that project livable. That seemed the best way for it to be sustainable because we did not have the internal resources at ODU to continue to sort of do this project at infinitum. We wanted to build the infrastructure, but we also felt that it was important for the community to feel as though this was something that they could continue to build on their own and not have to rely on the university to sort of continuously uh, come in. We want to provide support, but not ultimately control the project. And of course, lastly, this challenge of memory versus accuracy that uh, many of the stories we collected were from senior folks in the neighborhood uh, whose, uh, you know, uh, whose, whose, whose stories were often sort of more recollections of things than specifically based facts. There are not a lot of maps that exist of the old neighborhood. 
Uh, and so oftentimes when we would ask someone to they would talk, someone would talk about a store in the neighborhood or a place in the neighborhood where they would hang out as a child, perhaps in the 1950s, they weren't 100% certain exactly where that was. And so uh, trying to sort of take these memories and transfer them precisely to sort of pinpoints on a map of where these things actually were occurring was often challenging. And we had to do a lot of guesswork to some extent. And there's an open question about how accurate exactly these places are as a result. Um, the project scope ran, we, we did that we conducted interviews and collected materials over the course of a two year period and built a website. We conducted 38 interviews with residents of the neighborhood. We also looked at extensive archives from the New Journal and Guide, uh, the African American newspaper, uh, previously the Norfolk Journal and Guide, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, and as well as ODU's own archives to build this resource. This is the website. Uh, it's, map, it's called Mapping Lambert's Point. It is still accessible, mappinglambertspoint.org. Uh, it basically, each node that you see here represents a story, a story, a story arc. Uh, that we organized. Uh, as you can see at the top of the screen, right, we collected stories and we then thematically organized them into stories about commercial life in the neighborhood, about educational life in the neighborhood, residential life in the neighborhood, social life in the neighborhood, and spiritual life in the neighborhood. And then within each of these, we then organized them by era, the uh, early 20th century, the mid 20th century, the 1970s, the 1990s, and then, uh, and then onwards in the present. And so overall, you know, there are almost 700 stories on the map uh, that across different eras. And um, if you click on a story, uh, you know, this is a story from residential life. Uh, you know, uh, you will get the story as it's recounted by the person who shared it has been transcribed, as well as if they provided any images to document those stories, those continue to exist. And so in some ways, I feel like the most successful part of the project was our ability to really at least embed stories about places into the map and continue to have this process ongoing. Um, for the sake of time, I will skip over. I, you know, I, I will ex exclude. I think some of the more fascinating stories that we that we um, encountered. But I will say that I do want to highlight just quickly two things, um, or three things actually. One, there were specific places that community members came back to over and over again as landmarks that were essential to their experience of that community that no longer exist. And one of them was the JJ Smallwood School, which was an all black school uh, located essentially where a parking lot now exists at Old Dominion University. Um, and those stories were quite fascinating because they really involved people who were living during school desegregation, who were involved from that period of time when the school ultimately shut down and they moved into integrated schools and they provided some very complex uh, stories about their experiences that I think really revealed a deep ambivalence about the experience. Many of them supported desegregation as I think many of us do, uh, but ultimately they also remembered that the school was a very wonderful and caring and loving place and that when they moved into uh, desegregated schools they often felt as though that aspect of care was lost in the community. They were also very cognizant of the fact that many of their teachers who they greatly admired didn't get to keep their jobs when the school shut down. And so uh, even though the story of desegregation is often one focusing on the importance of, uh, you know, sort of eliminating uh, sort of the segregated school system, uh, it's important that these stories were quite ex exceptional in sort of capturing the complexity of emotions that that experience evoked. Um, the other space that was uh, sort of really important, I think, to sort of emphasize was there were a lot of stories about uh, black owned businesses and entrepreneurship in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, as a neighborhood that's right now sort of experienced is would be categorized as working poor, uh, there's often this perception and often, of course, it's subjugated, subjected to these stereotypes that often, uh, you know, sort of follow around unfairly communities of color that these communities are always been poor and they need a handout and they and they don't and why don't they just basically work harder at it the reality of course is that this is a neighborhood that has been you know sort of entrepreneurial from its very get go and at different eras had thriving uh, black owned businesses in them, many of whom were forced out of business through redlining practices that denied them bank loans, uh, through gentrification practices that basically put, you know, sort of allowed those spaces to be consumed, not just by the university, by, by other uh, sort of uh, non uh, members of the community moving into it. And that history, I think, is really essential to kind of understanding 
the frustrations of that community in terms of uh, being quite upset about essentially uh, having those stories, when those stories are denied public record are denied uh, sort of circulation, then what ends up happening is there is a misperception that they don't know how to solve their own problems, right? That the community uh, has often said, right, they absolutely understand what would allow the what would allow it to basically become thriving again. What they lack are resources and what they lack are partners who are willing to basically work with them. It's never been a lack of uh, ideas or uh, investment in the community by its own merits. So those stories I think were really, really key. Let me take one more minute and then I will turn this over. Um, Thank you, uh, Abby. Yes, we, I, we, I hope we'll get more chance to, to talk in the, okay, in the that, conversation. Oh, I see where we're at. You're absolutely. So, so sorry, Andy. And, you know, I'm so sorry, Andy. We have uh, a few minutes to the end and hopefully we'll get some chance to talk at the, you know, in the meetup. <clears throat> and are we are we going until noon? Is that the time or? It's let let's ask Patty. I think you know, like it was eleven forty five. Oh, that's <laughs> but we can stretch it. Eleven forty five. I think it will stay on for a little bit longer than that. But after okay. a little bit, it will cut us off. So go okay. for it, Andy, and we'll hope for the best. Okay. All righty. Well, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Plunk. I am Director of Community Outreach and Partnership at Eastern Virginia Medical School and Associate Professor in the Division of Community Health and Research in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, <clears throat> I am an ethicist and social epidemiologist by training, um, and most of my pre-COVID-19 research has focused on drug policy and policy implementation. Um, so my research falls into two broad areas. One uses large data sets to look at the impact of state and national level policy, um, and we've done that with alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco policy. Um, I also look at local policy change, and that work includes <clears throat> an emphasis on engaging lay community members. Uh, for the last several years, we've studied smoking bans in Norfolk, Virginia, low-income housing. Um, it turns out that those bans aren't well implemented, um, that they can actually promote indoor smoking rather than reduce it. Um, we found that constructs like perceived parents of the smoking ban and trust in institutions uh, played a role in whether residents felt <clears throat> an obligation to comply with the bans um, and also subsequently affected um, other decision making, such as quitting smoking. Um, and we have National Cancer Institute funding to study those bans uh, in our region. So fast forward to the pandemic. Um, we realized early on that it would significantly disrupt our community engagement activities. Um, particularly with our community advisory board, with whom we've been meeting for several years. <clears throat> um, and I think we also realized that we couldn't just lean on the solution of just trying to naively transition to online meetings with them, um, because there were substantial barriers there. So we provided uh, Chromebooks to our CAB members. Um, I placed the order on March 14th, 2020, which was the Saturday after the week that um, <clears throat> everything really got rolling on our end as far as travel restrictions and, and starting to work from home. Um, but it also developed pretty quickly. Um, we had gotten an email on the 10th encouraging, encouraging us to limit business travel, but by the 13th, that was prohibited. Um, that same day, we got notices telling us that all of our classes would be moved online. Um, and the 13th also marked the day that the Virginia Public Schools um, school closings were announced as well. So basically the day after that, um, I put in the Chromebook order <clears throat> and I, um, I did order all of them myself so that they'd arrive faster. Um, and we were able to get those handed out to our cab members within a week. Um, it took a few days to get everyone squared away, um, but we had our first virtual meeting <clears throat> the week of March 30th of last year. Um, I'd say that we got a crash course in providing technical support, especially to older public housing residents. Um, some of whom had never used a computer before. And <clears throat> while people talk a lot about it now, and I think um, some of the other, uh, some of my other colleagues have mentioned it as well, um, but I really do think that it's difficult to appreciate how deep the digital divide actually is um, until you try to help someone navigate it. Looking back at what we've learned over the past year, <clears throat> I've come to realize that my understanding of marginalization, you know, and that's a term that I think many of us aren't always comfortable with, um, but still, my understanding of that as an idea was completely inadequate. Um, 
despite having worked with these communities for years, um, being left out or getting left behind has taken on completely new meaning for me. Um, and lack of capacity to respond to that, lack of access, it's a recurring theme. Um, <clears throat> but we were able to start meeting with the cab weekly at that time. Um, and I'd say that we really got a handle on what was happening in their communities during the pandemic. Um, and I think this is where we started to realize in real time that what in our minds were the worst case scenarios about the impact of COVID-19 on low income communities um, were becoming a reality. We started this period with 11 cab members from Norfolk. Half of them ended up getting COVID-19 at some point during the past year. Um, one of them quite early in March. Fully a third of them ended up in the hospital in the ICU. Um, several of them got sick early on when treatment protocols are still being developed. Um, and I'll be completely honest, I'm quite surprised that all of them survived. It's, you know, even though their hospital stays were still pretty rough, and even though the impact of the disease on them isn't captured in the mortality statistics that I think we oftentimes make too much of, um, <clears throat> It's definitely still affecting them, and I imagine likely will for the rest of their lives. Um, and that's just the direct impact of the disease itself. Excuse me. The indirect effects of the pandemic, um, such as socioeconomic costs associated with the lockdowns, um, those will be affecting these folks for a long, long time. Um, and again, I think in ways that <clears throat> we can't yet begin to truly understand. So. So fairly early on, we started to get a sense that constructs like perceived fairness and mistrust, which had been important for our smoke-free housing research, um, <clears throat> also seemed to be related to how seriously folks were taking COVID-19. Um, the decision to follow public health guidance, such as social distancing, mask wearing, getting a test, and now vaccination, um, <clears throat> seemed to be related to how people felt about important institutions that were disseminating that guidance. Um, trust in other sources of information also seem to be playing a role. So during this time, we're also learning more about how to create that capacity to interact with us virtually. Um, in retrospect, the thing I'm <clears throat> most proud of about our response um, is that we were really proactive. Um, we anticipated that this was going to turn everything upside down and that the responsibility for ensuring that we'd still be able to engage with folks would ultimately lie with us. Um, I think it's true that that's true with community engagement generally, um, but COVID-19 certainly raised the stakes with that. Um, in our case, that meant committing to not letting a lack of access to technology be a limiting factor on our ability to interact with our community partners. <clears throat> so that has rightly become a foundational guiding principle for us. Um, <clears throat> but that obviously doesn't mean that you immediately have it all figured out. Um, we discovered that even if we did provide a computer with webcam, uh, that we'd still be limited by people not having a good internet connection. Um, some folks relied on their phones for their data, you know, and that wasn't unlimited. Um, you know, we didn't want to create a situation where someone was having to um, use all their cell data to join us on a weekly Zoom call. Um, and while Chromebooks are cheap, the webcams really aren't all that great. So we're also learning about what kind of technology is best for this. So we took those lessons um, and applied for and were awarded funding under NIH's Radix Up program, um, which stands for <clears throat> Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics um, for Underserved Populations to study how to adapt COVID-19 guidance to improve uptake in low-income communities. Um, a large part of the study is devoted to creating capacity for folks to interact with us virtually. Um, so we now have a preference for tablets over the Chromebooks. Um, their cameras are usually very good for the price. And while their screens are a little bit smaller, uh, <clears throat> it's still better than trying to use a phone, which some folks had started to transition to. Um, mobile operating systems like those used in most tablets also seem to be easier to teach folks how to use. Um, Chromebooks themselves aren't super complicated, but there's still enough going on there that seem to be distracting for some people. So <clears throat> we provide a tablet to everyone who works with us. Um, they also get two years of unlimited data and um, through a cellular service that's tied to the tablet. Um, 
and we also provide basic digital literacy training and tech support to everybody. Um, again, we found that a proactive approach is best with this. Um, before each meeting, we'll reach out to folks who've indicated that they might have a problem, for example, um, and we'll actively walk them through getting signed on just to, you know, just to head off any issues that they might have. So how has all this worked out? Um, <clears throat> granted, this has taken place with the pandemic as a backdrop, which certainly affects, you know, how I judge everything. Um, but I, I have to say that, you know, by every criterion by which I would think to judge community engagement, this really has been an unmitigated success. Um, as I mentioned, we've been meeting with folks, <clears throat> you know, low income folks over the past year um, during the worst public health crisis of modern times. Um, none of that interaction with them has put them at any risk. We did all of that completely in line with social distancing guidelines. Um, community engagement relies on, on building relationships and um, <clears throat> and I think that's difficult even when you know, you're, be, you're able to be face to face with someone. Um, we already had those relationships with folks in Norfolk, so I felt pretty good about being able to meaningfully engage with them virtually. Um, I knew there'd be challenges, but I thought we could address those. Um, the way I've described my mindset going in was that I was really in relationship maintenance mode primarily. Um, I wanted to make sure that restrictions on that face to face contact didn't set us so far back that <clears throat> our community engagement couldn't recover after the pandemic was over. Um, so I truly didn't appreciate being able to build new relationships this way, especially not from with folks from communities who um, who rightfully mistrust outsiders. Um, I mean, we got to where we're at in Norfolk um, by putting in the time and maintaining a presence in those communities um, over the course of several years. And then, of course, there's the barriers to access, like I touched on before. Um, but now we're currently meeting with over 30 CAB members from all across our region. Um, our CAB now includes residents from seven additional cities in central and southeastern Virginia. And we're currently expanding our engagement to include folks who live in the very rural portion of, um, <clears throat> of uh, Virginia on the eastern shore. Um, our attendance is better than it was in person. We consistently get 100% attendance at our weekly meetings now. Um, Coordinating travel was very difficult before, um, and the transition to virtual meetings has made that much easier. Um, so I don't think we could have created the regional representation um, that we have had we not moved to the to virtual, um, if we had not moved everything online. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> in closing, I've, uh, I think we've been able to successfully implement virtual community engagement in our region. Um, being a pr proactive about that was key. Um, we knew that we had to take the responsibility for building that capacity. Um, there's definitely a learning curve with providing some of the tech support, and that can also be time intensive. Um, but my sense is that the most important step to doing good community engagement is just committing to doing it the right way, um, regardless of whether you're doing that in person or virtually. Thank you so much. Thank you all for a wonderful, rich discussion. And um, and I think um, I'll pass it on to, to Patty to close us off and move us forward. Yes, thank you all for really wonderful presentations and a wonderful view into the region. Uh, you know, this is the end now of the webinar, but at this time we invite all of you and all of the, you know, you know, all of you participants, all of you attendees to please join McBeb and all the speakers on the Hoover meetup. It's the Hoover channel one meetup for further dis discussions. Um, and uh, very importantly, when you go to that Hoover meetup from the Hoover link, they, you know, it may ask you to download a Chrome browser extension disregard that, don't do that. You'll be able to assess the channel meetup by simply you know, clicking out of that notice, typing in your name and selecting join meeting. So thank you all for attending this session. Please see us during the meetup for any questions and we hope you enjoyed this session. So um, participants, I will just say to all of you, I have put in the chat here, for the Hoover meetup, and you should have also gotten an email if you uh, had 
logged into Whova before, or you know, we will by email know how to get there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.